right vector. Okay, the uh, Dean has asked us for all of our meetings. You have to turn on your uh, cameras. Welcome, Victor Gerardo Brandon. Thank you. <laughs> okay, just waiting for uh, some more people to sign in. All right, let me go ahead. Do, da, 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 da. Here comes Izar. Three. Seven, four, okay, five of us so far. All right, <clears throat> for the um, four of you who are on presently, welcome. Did you uh, receive the instructions or the link for the multi-SIM? And how many of you have the multi-SIM installed? Uh, Gerardo here, uh, I have it installed. Cool, all right. And that's wonderful that we're able to get a free one of the best four letter words there is in the English language, uh, free for use of six for six months, the uh, multi-SIM. There's um, the Tina is a great piece of software, <clears throat> which is also for free. The multi-SIM uh, more aligns with <clears throat> what it is that we do in school because we, we have multi-SIM and uh, Since this has become available to us, the uh, subsequent circuit bills that we're going to be doing for circuit analysis and such will be done in multi-SIM. So keep an eye out for additional worksheets coming out on that. So let me go ahead and take a roll call and see where we are on. Okay. T-SIM install. So Gerardo is a yes. You finish your multi-SIM install? Yes. Izar, did you uh, get my message and install your multi-SIM? I have to unmute your microphone, Izar. Here comes Trini. Let me go ahead and bring him in. Well, Izar is working with his microphone. Brandon, did you, uh, well, let's see. You found a solution for your Tina, which is great. And so are you also 
uh, going to be able to use that same um, PC for installing the multi sim. Mm -hmm. uh, I am installing it right now. Good. Okay, I'll put down a yes. All right, Trini Basel Duo, welcome. So, Izar, you get your microphone unmuted yet? Uh, yeah. Sorry. Okay, and uh, you got my email message. Were you able to get multi sim installed yet? Uh, yeah, I'm starting right now. Okay, good. Anzar Cardenas, multi sim is coming along. Yes. All right, Brandon. Yes, yes that was the yes for you. Uh, Victor, how about you? Yes, I have both Tina and multi sim. Wonderful. Excellent. Excellent. Okay, so Trinity Bustle Dua, you missed us last week, I believe. Uh, welcome. And yeah, sorry, I've been dealing with some things, kind of, sorry. No, hey, well, I'm just glad that you're, you're with us. Uh, so you got my email regarding... Um, yeah, I, I, I started downloading earlier, but I think, I think it's, I just have to install it because I think I downloaded it already, so I'm working on it. Okay, all right, so downloading and install, so that's fine. So let me make sure Basildua is downloaded. Okay. Now, all right, that's great. And let's take a look here. Okay. The um, next project that we're going to be working on is going to be the uh, sound to light kit. It will be this guy right here. Okay. And let me see if anybody's still holding. And what I'm going to do is see if there's any noteworthy challenges on this particular guy that you all need to be aware of. What you ought to be doing in addition to this is the other software that you're asked to do uh, installation of, download and installation of, you need to get in place because we will be using Visio for uh, doing the flow charts. Because you're going to have to do some flow charts with Visio, so you've got to make sure your Visio is downloaded. You also have to make sure your Eagle is downloaded, and also your Ulti board needs to be downloaded. So all the software that was in week one and week two for you to download, you want to make sure that you get all that done. The um, um, there is a really, really fun pro project where you're going to be doing the drawings for um, laser cutting your box. And there's a really, really nice box project that once you have the laser cut drawings done, you send them to me, I forward them to Nabil. Nabil will laser cut those parts on wood in the... Uh, in the lab and sometime when we get back, then you'll be able to retrieve those and use the laser cut part for one of your last projects, which is which will be a lot of fun. The um, things were particularly, all right, so back to last week's project as I take a look at where we stand on it. Mm -hmm. See who has a note. <laughs> Were there any particular challenges that anybody had encountered? Yeah, me with the BCO download, but um, I gotta call Microsoft and figure out a way to put them on because they request me. Well, I pay for the BCO, but they asked me to buy an app in order to use it. So <laughs> that's why I had to call them. I haven't had a chance to call them back yet. Huh. Okay. Let me also check with Nabil on that because uh, it wasn't it wasn't my recollection that that students had to to buy anything with respect to Visio. But uh, let, let me check with him on that. Uh, but with respect to the lab kit, were there any questions uh, pertaining to the lab kit, the one we built last week? Mm -hmm. No. Pretty straightforward. Okay. Let me take a look here. 51. Let's see who uploaded what. 
go to grades. Mm -hmm. Okay. And while I'm looking at that, we can have a view of this guy. Let's start pointing out some noteworthy things. All right. Let's do this guy here. And the schematic. Okay. Very nice. So what it is that you have here for this particular project, the project is called Sound to Light. And the objective here is um, there's a microphone. When you speak into the microphone, will cause these four LEDs to flash. The intensity of your volume of sound, whether you speak into this or whether you, uh, oh, let me let somebody else in, hold on. Okay. Yeah, the intensity of your your voice or uh, other sound picked up by the microphone will be reflected in the intensity of the LEDs that are flashing. Now you can adjust the threshold of when these begin to flash by rotating the little knob on this potentiometer. So let's go back a little bit and talk about the different parts. You've already had a chance to play with the microphone microphone is on your existing uh, kit that you all built and the you've had some LEDs that you've had to solder what's more quite a bit more sophisticated in this particular project is this is an amplifying circuit that is tied to tied to the output with the LEDs and I'll explain the schematic to you in, in just a moment the you will need uh, what's not included, but you will need your own 9-volt battery for this particular project. And um, you already have the necessary tools. The overall difficulty is marked as a 2 dot out of 5, so it really is not a particularly challenging project, um, as long as you're very, very careful of putting the correct value resistors in the appropriate locations. Okay, uh, as I was reviewing the soldering project, um, the, 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 the quality of the soldering of your various projects that you've turned in so far, there's been a bit of difference with respect to the quality of soldering. And so the pictures that you uh, send in and upload, let's take a look here. Uh, the lab project, let's take a look who submitted the most recent one. Okay, and yes, so several things. You're supposed to, okay, Brandon, you're killing me. Sorry. <laughs> you're killing me, okay? I don't want four pictures. If you have four pictures, which is wonderful, what you need to do is put those four pictures in one document. That way I'm only opening two things. I should only be opening one Word document that has your pictures close up and a selfie in it. And then the other one is a short movie that shows how it's working dynamically. Yeah. So if all my, yes, so if all my students didn't snip the pictures and put it into a Word document, then I'm opening many, many more things. So I, I commented on that. Um, I wasn't sure how to uh, put a movie inside the Word doc and I assume that if you were going to um, submit a file using Google Docs or just Google Drive in general, you can't do it with your computer, uh, the file from your computer. So um, I uploaded it the way I did because of that. Okay, well, I, I see a movie. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, oh, yeah. And this has to be downloaded in order for me to see it okay so there's the movie so the movie is coming along mm -hmm. it's that's fine but the 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 pictures which are of the primarily of the back side of the board yeah. close up 
so I can see the quality of the soldering mm -hmm. as I'm looking at the soldering. Yeah, most of these look pretty good. They're trash. Yeah, none of them are too heavy. Yeah, none of them are too heavy. Nah, they're horrible. They're horrible. No. A couple of them could be better. Anyway. Yeah, yeah. All right. Anyway, that movie is ready. So let's take a look at the movie. or I might have fried it when I was soldering it. But I remember that's going to happen on yeah, that's going that, that that may happen on some LEDs. Not to worry tremendously about that as long as it's mostly working. I think you're going to all have to exercise a more gentle touch with mm -hmm. respect to that. So what it is I was looking at, let me share my screen. Let me make sure if anybody else is waiting. No, it doesn't appear like anybody else is waiting. So let me go ahead and share the screen. And on share screen, I'll go here and then go here. And so what it is, you can see a video. I'll make this just a tad larger so you can see this and run the video. There. You didn't try different frequencies. I'm just curious. Okay, yeah, your LED four and six. You, you weren't the only one that had challenges with four and six. There's something interesting about four and six. Oh, it's four and there. six? Oh, let's go. Let's go. Yeah, let's go. four and six. Yeah, it was just weird. Uh, you weren't the only one that had challenges on four and six. So maybe it could be something having to do with the board, maybe something having to do with the. Uh, um, it couldn't be it couldn't be coincidence that more than one person had uh, LED four and six challenges. Uh, so this is what we want to try to avoid avoid my friends is one movie's fine and then one word document in place of uh, a bunch of different uh, photo uploads. Okay, let's go ahead and stop the share. Okay, back on here. All right, so let me get onto the camera. Let's select the appropriate one. And we're not picking on you. It just happened to have, you know, pick, uh, Brandon. It's not you. It's just a, a general statement for everybody. All right. So, so yeah. everybody, no, yeah. not not picking on this young man. All right. So let's see. We are on this camera. Okay. Let me go ahead and make this. Mr. Ko, my friend. Yes. Uh, question. Um, mine. This is Victor. Yes, Victor. Mind the video I sent to you, uh, it doesn't go as a meter, as engaged, as engage, but it goes uh, flicker in every other um, LED. It goes on the sequence mode. It doesn't, ri it doesn't rise as a, as a gauge. Uh, when they, whenever, whatever noises I make, it doesn't do it. It just go like okay. Let's just go ahead and play that. Yeah, and I think that for that particular project, that's just fine. We're not, that'll be okay. As long as you've got most things working on that, that'll be fine. It really is a, next to the jumbo LED project, it's, it's in, in the sequence of things that we're concerned about, uh, it is um, uh, a good stepping stone exercise. This particular one that you're building this week will be more, specific to uh, make this one the big one. Let's 
speaker view. Mm. Okay, let me mute all. There. And okay. All right. Let me move this screen over to here. And there. Okay, I can still see you and you can see what's going on with this particular um, project. All right, so getting back to this particular project, what's fun about this is uh, it has the microphone that will pick up varying intensities of sound. So you want to start off with sound very soft, very soft level of speaking like this as a whisper, and then you raise your voice slowly and you raise your voice louder, or you might just issue a tone like Brandon did, you can go, ah, like that. And you just raise the voice. And when you do so, you will see the intensity of these LEDs go from flicker, from nothing to a flicker to very, very bright and an always on with no flicker. Now, if you're able to achieve that too soon, then you might want to turn the potentiometer uh, to lessen the sensitivity of the microphone. Uh, or if you find yourself shouting into it and you've not gotten any appreciable illumination of the LEDs, then you might want to increase the sensitivity of the microphone by raising this particular, by turning this particular potentiometer. Notice that everything is shown in the illustration as being cut down on the board. The thing that you're going to have to be careful of are the transistors. The transistors, as you've already uh, learned in your existing project, uh, have leads that are that will not allow the transistor to go flush onto the board. Do not try to push your transistor flush onto the board because you'll end up breaking the leads. Your transistor will sit just a, a, a uh, maybe three or four, probably four millimeters off the board by the time you get the transistors pushed in place. Now there are different kinds of transistors here, so you'll have to use a magnifying glass to look at the part numbers of the transistors and make sure you put the appropriate transistor in the appropriate circuit position. When I open this particular guy up and we look at the schematic, a couple of things here. The illustration here is pretty good. Goes to show uh, your soldering. We should have nice little cones like this, uh, Hershey's Kiss type type cones on the soldering. You do not want big balloon apple shaped things um, because two things. If the trace on the board, if these traces are not hot enough to accept the, yeah, if these traces are not hot enough to accept the solder, then you'll end up with something that's kind of an apple shaped uh, solder joint. You also have to be careful not to put too much heat on the trace because we've had some students burn traces completely off the board by leaving the iron on too long. So what is the rule of thumb? The rule of thumb is to have the wire come through. As the wire of the element comes through, you are putting your soldering iron onto the wire as well as the trace simultaneously. And you're holding it there and you're counting five seconds. What's five seconds? 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, 1,004, 1,005. After five seconds, while you're still holding your iron on the wire and the trace together, then you bring in your solder. Okay, you bring in your solder. When you bring in your solder, you hold it where the wire and the iron meets and you let that solder melt and you let it, and you move this around to allow it to flow nicely around, then you lift both off simultaneously. That should result in not too much heat applied. If you find yourself leaving your iron on that trace for more than uh, five seconds plus another five or eight seconds to perform the task, you may be one of the uh, candidates that unfortunately burns a trace off the board. 
The uh, other thing you want to make note of is before you solder is to look at these traces because the, I said before, you want to make sure that as you solder pins that are close to each other, it is not to allow the solder from one pin to go and flow and connect to the pin next to it. That will create a solder bridge that would compromise your circuit. However, on this particular board, there are some traces that are already joined. So here happens to be trace, trace, and trace, and these are already joined. So as they are already joined, it doesn't matter if you go a little heavier on these solder joints. So exercise great care when you look at what you're soldering before you go to it with solder is to make sure are these traces joined or are they separate? If you look over here, this is where the V-E-L-E velamen, the letters are in reverse on the, um, on the underside of the board. If you look here, these two traces here are together, okay? They are joined. So as I have a wire lead coming up on this hole and a wire lead coming up on this hole, it's perfectly appropriate that the solder might connect these two. However, they also happen to be close to this guy over here. This guy over here is completely separate. There cannot be a solder bridge between this one and those two. You follow what I'm saying? Okay, let me see if I can hold this up to the light and let it focus and let you see things a little better. So the ones I'm pointing to, these two guys over here are together. Make sure that as you go to solder, it's perfectly okay that the solder connects these two wires that come up through these holes together. But under no circumstances are you going to make a bridge between this particular trace and those two. Is that clear, everybody? Okay. And yes. then over here were the three, a little, uh, this is a little better magnification for you. These three are already together, and it's okay if they touch each other in the final process. What you're going to have to watch out for, uh, something that looks very tricky. You see this group of three here? One, two, three. They are completely separate, and you cannot have any bridge between these two pins, or the board will not work. These two are joined. These four and these four, so a total of eight in here, these are all separate. So study the board very carefully and know where you can uh, have a heavier hand in soldering. Uh, and also, like here, these are joined. Here, these are joined. These are all completely split in this middle portion of the board, yes? And then if I go to this other portion of the board right here, you can see that these two are joined as well. So you can be a little more cavalier about having the solder of, on this wire and this wire possibly touch each other. All right, so those are the, the caveats to be concerned with on the underside of the board. Any questions on the underside of the board? Okay, now I'll take a look at the schematic and I will go ahead and explain this to you. It's a really, really good circuit. <clears throat> All right, so what I'm going to have is uh, a discussion about some circuitry. Some of this, you might not understand the, the terminology that I'm using yet, because this is, um, has to do with amplifiers. And in ESIS 50, we haven't studied amplifiers. But in one of the other classes, 52, a little bit on circuits, 54, you will be touching on amplifiers if you haven't already, if you're in the Mr. Reyes's 54 class. And we will touch on amplifiers again when we get into uh, ESIS uh, 60. So let's see if I can bring this guy down like this. I really like this doc cam. <laughs> All right. So what you have on the far lower left, M300, that's your microphone. That is the beginning of the signal. And so the signal uh, will come in and go through a coupling capacitor. C1 is used as a coupling capacitor and will go into a uh, NPN BJT. B NPN is uh, the type of material. Uh, BJT is bipolar junk transistor. So T1 stands for transistor number one. And this happens to be a what we call a voltage divider bias. Bias means how we're turning this guy on. 
So we're turning this guy on by using R2 and R3 as part of a voltage divider. And then we have different parts of the transistor noted here. The transistor has three wires as noted by the, this wire here, and then the wire here, and the wire here. Now the signal that will come in will come in through what we call the base lead through the coupling capacitor into the base lead. The signal will flow up through the transistor through R1 and out of R1, this is where your potentiometer is. This is your adjustment, your 220k ohm. The, this will adjust the amount of signal that will come through C2. C2 is in coupling capacitor. C2 brings us into another voltage divider Transistor number two. This is another NPN bipolar junction transistor. And the biasing gives you very stable. These are both very stable design uh, transistor circuits. Also notice that the part numbers are the same. The part number here is a 547. That's a 547. Here we have a 547, but the last transistor over here, T4, is a 557. What's characteristic about T1, T2, and T3 is in addition to the part number being 547, 547, and 547, is the arrow we call the arrow lead, the, the lead of the transistor that has the arrow, the emitter. These are all pointing away from the body of the transistor. So this is the emitter, this is the base, and this lead up here is the collector. This is the emitter, this is the base, and that's the collector lead of the transistor. Emitter, base, and collector lead. What's different about T4, T4 is not an NPN. T4 is a, what we call a PNP. And in a, in a later discussion, you'll learn the significance of the difference of those two. However, take a look at the arrow and how it's pointing in the schematic of T4. The arrow, instead of pointing away from the transistor, is actually pointing into the transistor. So this tells us it is a PNP transistor. And you want to make sure that when you mount T4 board, it is decidedly different from the other transistors. Now, how can you tell the transistor parts? Well, if I lay a transistor down here, there's the transistor, one of them, and I position it towards the light. I might move it over this side. Try not to upset the focus too much on this. Try to catch it on the light uh, in the camera. Anyway, you'll find when you hold it to the light at a certain angle, and this is starting to show it, uh, you'll be able to see the part number labeled on the flat face of the transistor. So make sure three of them are labeled the same as 547, and one of them that is different is T4. Where do they appear on the, on the circuit board? On the circuit board, on the circuit board, T4 appears right over here. So your T1, uh, T1 is over here, T2 is over here, T3 is over here, and then they, they are the same, T1, T2, and T3. T4 is the one that's different. You want to make sure it stays different. The transistors are also, they also are drawn as not a full circle, but a portion of a circle with a flat edge, and that is the shape of the transistor that you're given. The shape of the transistor that you're given is shaped exactly that way. It has a flat face, and it's a almost a circular uh, arrangement as you look at it from on top. All right. Any, any questions regarding the three transistors being same and T4 being different? All right. Let me get onto the schematic and finish the uh, discussion for you here. So transistor one, transistor two are both voltage divider biased. They are both NPN, PNP, NPN BJTs, bipolar junction transistors. The signal does come into the base of the first transistor, comes out of the collector, goes into the base of the second transistor, comes out of the collector. So C1, C2, and C3 are known as coupling capacitors. Coupling capacitors block DC. They preserve the integrity of the DC to keep each stage completely separate. So the DC that happens in this first stage 
is completely separate of the DC that happens in this stage, completely separate of what happens here. So none of the stages will interfere with each other with respect to DC. The signal on this second transistor will leave the collector lead, come down here, and again, go into the base of T3. Coming into, coming into T3 on the base, the signal will come up through the collector lead, through this resistor, and through the base of T4. You kind of get the sense that as we're using transistors, any kind of signal that we're likely to put in either from a microphone or some other signal generator is going to go into which lead of these transistors? I've been using what word so far? It's called the base, okay? B-A-S-E. And they come out of the collector into the base, out of the collector into the base, out of the collector collector. Now, what's interesting about T4 and it, its particular arrangement, it is also voltage divider bias, and it is used as a current amplifier because the signal is coming out of its collector. The collector happens to be on the lower portion of this diagram, and the signal will come through here to ground. And as it comes through here to ground, it has LED number one, number two, number three, and number four in its current path and that's what will light this up. So the intensity of what's going on here will be adjusted by the potentiometer there, and as it's amplified from a little tiny fly fart size signal into something a little stronger in T2, into something that's even stronger in T3, and finally in T4, we're using T4 for, for driving current to drive these LEDs, the, the signal is strong enough to drive these LEDs and illuminate them. And the amount of illumination will depend on how strong the signal is coming in, all of which you can adjust by your, the volume of your voice or tone that you put in here, as well as the adjustment of the potentiometer that's there. So it's a really, really practical schematic. It's a real, it's a real world schematic. It's the, uh, the basis of many kinds of amplifier circuits you're likely to find. You'll see something very similar to this in your cell phone. Your cell phone has a microphone, yeah? Your cell phone also has a speaker that plays to your ear. Well, guess what? Instead of LEDs that are being driven by this last transistor, there would be a speaker out here that would be playing sound to your ear. But the concept of microphone to speaker is very similar to this particular drawing in uh, overall concept. Now, what the circuitry in the cell phone is quite a bit more sophisticated, but uh, again, in terms of how signal purses from the input stage to the output stage of a multi-stage amplifier is the same concept here on the circuit board as well as in your uh, cell phones. Any questions? Okay. Now, as you look at your different parts, the most noteworthy thing that's different on this particular guy will be, let me pour these parts out. All right, microphone is interesting because if we look at the microphone trace on the board, you can see that we have a positive, a negative, and then there's a slot right next to the negative, yes? So what I'm pointing to, the microphone is right here. Here I have a positive lead, a negative lead, and there's the slot. What is the slot for? Well, this particular microphone is a little different than the previous one that you've had. This particular microphone happens to have a piece of metal let me not confuse the camera here. Okay, it has this piece of metal. So it has a positive lead, has a negative lead, and the negative lead is the one that's closest to this piece of metal, and that piece of metal is what goes into slot. So as I will take this and position it like so, that metal will go like this. Now it won't go flush onto the board and the reason why it won't go flush onto the board and I'll hold it at this angle you can see that is a uh, white nylon 
piece underneath the microphone, and that's what will keep the microphone from going flush onto the board. But does everybody understand the reason for that slot is to give you more structural integrity of your soldering, so this way you're not not as likely to damage or uh, break these wires, uh, wire leads of the microphone, okay? So this will get a good heavy dose of soldering. And in order to get that metal tab to get any kind of uh, solder onto it at all, you will have to hold the iron at this angle on the metal, on the trace, get it nice and hot, count your five seconds, and then dip your solder in and get a nice Hershey's kiss around the negative lead and that tab, okay? But make sure none of that spills over onto the uh, positive wire because there is a gap in the trace here. We don't want to bridge that with too much solder. Any questions on the microphone? Okay, all right, pretty straightforward there. I'll pull this guy off. And then the other thing to, to not lose, very easy to lose, is this guy right here. This is your potentiometer. And this guy is the shaft to turn your potentiometer. Now, the potentiometer has your typical uh, three pins. Shaft is rolling away. Make sure it doesn't roll away off of mama's dining room table and under the floor somewhere where you lose it, okay? Uh, so the potentiometer will go right here let's take a look rv1 so rv1 will go like so like that this particular fellow will be arranged like so It'll, there will be a gap between it and the board simply because the metal of the uh, of the tines will not allow it to go flush onto the board it's okay that it doesn't uh, you can bend these slightly in order to get uh, good soldering in place. Then, once that's soldered in place, this particular fellow comes in here and pushes in, like so, and to which you can then rotate this clockwise or counterclockwise in this fashion in order to affect the um, sensitivity of the microphone that is demonstrated by this portion of your schematic. So the RV1 is your potentiometer. That's this guy right here. And physically it is this guy on the board, okay? So do not lose this little black shaft because if you do, you'll have to have a round toothpick with crazy glue. And uh, that's the only way you're gonna be able to turn that particular uh, potentiometer if you lose that particular um, sh uh, black shaft. Other than that, everything else is pretty standard and straightforward. You are given uh, mounting screws. So you happen to have these mounting screws. The mounting screws, we're not going to be used in this particular case, so set those aside. There happens to be four going into each of the four holes on the corners. The other noteworthy thing is the capacitor. This is a pretty good size capacitor. This is your C4 capacitor. Your C4 capacitor right here is 100 microfarad polarized. So you got to make sure that the positive stays on the positive and the negative stays on the negative. You are, the capacitor is identified on its body with a white band and a stripe showing that that particular lead is the negative lead. It is the shorter of the two, so it's negative to be short, positive to be long. And you can double check its value and make sure that its value does say, yeah, right there, 100 microfarads, okay? and we'll go onto the board, and as the illustration shows, it will have its wire leads bent. So it goes onto the board like so, like so. Get this down, and don't push it all the way down because you have to bend gently so that it'll stay on the board like so, okay? And it'll be flat, oops, sorry. 
they'll be flat flush on the board in that fashion. So you can see that better there. Okay, any questions regarding the capacitor C4? All right. That's good. Okay, I think everything else is, is pretty straightforward. The resistors are what they are. The LEDs are what they are. Be careful as you solder uh, wires onto the uh, LEDs um, or the wires of the LEDs not to burn them out. And I, I, I encourage you to, to use caution on the LED solder uh, connections. Be, uh, use a gent what I call a gentle hand now because later on in the next few projects, you will be working with surface mount LEDs and surface mount uh, LED surface mount resistors are tiny. They are the size of one fourth of the, uh, these resistors that's on the drawing of your cardboard direction sheet. So if you have this in front of you, imagine something that's one fourth the size of this rectangle and you will be soldering something that is that small and something that small will have a positive side and something that small will have a negative side. So you're not just soldering something that's one fourth the size of this. The actual solder points are edges of uh, uh, those uh, surface mount components. So those are the most easily burnt out components. So you have to definitely exercise a gentle hand. So we hope to be able to see all four of your LEDs lit and running on this particular project. And um, you'll be uploading the video as you have done. The, the flip side of the board, I do need one or two good shots of the flip side of this with the solder joints. And uh, make sure that when you do get this done, use a Sharpie marker and mark your initials on some big area of the board like there's a nice big spot. So go ahead and mark uh, you know, XB or DF or CK or whatever. I would put KO right there since it's nice and big. That way we can identify that the board is yours because the close up is less important to have your smiling face and more important that I see the quality of the soldering. Uh, and if I can see the quality of the soldering close up in this fashion, then I can make comments on what you need to improve on before we go to the more advanced soldering projects. Any questions on this so far? Could uh, we use a different type of uh, soldering iron, maybe one that we have at home? Yeah, what about the, the type of soldering iron? Who asked the question? This is Edwin. Um, yeah, I have another one with Edmund? a uh, fine, yeah, Ed, Edwin, yes. with a with a finer point. Just wondering if I could uh, try that one out for smaller components. Well, yes. So some of you may already have um, soldering tools, and uh, yes, the, the the rule of thumb is use whatever is necessary to achieve the best result. Uh, just because we happen to have distributed soldering components from our inventory doesn't mean you're required to use them if you happen to have something that is uh, going to give you a better result. And some of our friends already have their own component, their own uh, um, electronics bench. Uh, so yeah, I'd leave that up to you. Okay, so to, the answer to your question is yes, whatever will help you achieve the best result um, is what you ought to be using. Good. Any other questions there? All right. All right. Let's talk a little bit about multi-SIM because in multi-SIM, we're going to be, let me close this guy up, put this guy away. All right. So in multi-SIM, we will be working with uh, AC and let me go to change this. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Now let's go to here and let's go to here. Be soon.
Wait a moment. And it may be behind my screen. So exit full screen. No, where's my multi sim? Well, a couple things are happening here. I'm also in the process of constructing something that may be helpful to you in the installation of Multisim. Some people already have it installed. It's pretty straightforward. So, but let me go through what it is that I have for you. I was hoping to actually have it running. Okay, so let me do a share. Select window to share will be this one, this one. <clears throat> Move back over here. Thank you very much. All right. Okay, do you see the PowerPoint for multi-SIM free six month download? Okay. Um, when you go to click on the link that you're provided, you will see this particular screen uh, it goes to show that not only are you getting LabVIEW, you're, not only are you getting multi-SIM, you're also getting what they call LabVIEW. So you click, you agree, and then on the next one, uh, if I always copy and pay, I always copy the serial number just in case they ask me for it later. Uh, I didn't finish this particular download only because I already have multi-SIM installed. I went and bought the student version back back when it used to cost $45, but hey, free for six months is always better. Then you click download, and then after you click download, then you will be on here where you select the appropriate windows that you're using, whether you're using 32-bit, 64-bit. Uh, even though mine's a 64-bit machine, we're never running these things so fast that it requires 64-bit. So I prefer not to use as the 64-bit the resources. So I just leave it on 32-bit and download. Then uh, if it asks you to set up a, a user account, then go ahead and set up a user account. I have several NI user accounts. This one is under the name of I'm a sample. And so hit login after you set up an account, you do log in. Once you log in, then you'll be able to access their software, indicate to them what is your status, and then you hit continue. Then after that, you will follow the appropriate steps. Uh, generally, what will happen is the download will occur and appear in the lower portion of your window right here as an exe file. If your, if your version of Windows doesn't demonstrate this here, then where else you will find the exe file will be in your downloads folder. So if you don't see it in this lower, course, lower por corner of your screen, it'll be in your downloads folder. So look there. Then what will happen is when you click the exe file, the thing will start running. You'll see NI Package Manager. You'll leave the default selections. Don't choose anything outside of the default checkboxes. Hit Next. Takes you over to another window. Don't change any of those settings. Hit Next. Then what you're going to do is, yes, you will accept the two licenses, and then you will hit Next. And then it may give you a message. It does on mine because I have a previous version of, of um, Elvis and, and, and NI multi-SIM installed. So if you happen to see any other messages, keep clicking next. Ultimately, what you want to do is to be able to so hit next again to see the thing do the installation. And as it goes through the installation, um, you want to make sure that you have the appropriate resources, memory space on your drive to be able to accommodate the, the download. And as long as you do, then everything should run smooth. You will probably be asked for uh, one more uh, agreement. Do you agree to their terms of, of usage? Click yes. 
and then finish your installation. In, in some instances, you may have to do a restart. In some instances, maybe not. So since we've had some time since we started our discussion at six o'clock, how many of you have finished your installation of multi-SIM? Uh, I ran into a problem. Um, so I'm downloading it on a uh, Mac. And we will work on a Mac. No, yeah, it will work on a Mac. Yeah. Um, but, but during one of the process of the, of the um, installation, uh, after it told me to read it and agree uh, to uh, everything, um, it wouldn't let me choose any of my partitions, whether it be my, my Mac OS or my, my partition window OS. Yes. I, I don't know what happened there. Um, so I try to click on everyone, and then you give me the the, the yellow, yellow with a yellow triangular sign with an exclamation po uh, point in it. So I was kind of like warning. Yeah, yeah, warning. Yeah, all three partitions. So I don't, I don't know what. Random. I had the same issue. I have a Mac too, and I had to use an old laptop because it never run on Mac, but it runs yeah. on PC. Oh really? The same. Yeah, I had exactly the same issue. So. I'm I'm running it on uh, Windows 7 now, mm -hmm. but it doesn't run on Mac. Oh, man. Even, 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 did you partition your Mac at all? Did you try it that way? Yeah, I try everything possible well, and nothing works, trust me. Because I can't, I can't buy another computer. <laughs> so. um, yeah, maybe uh, you know, for the few weeks, few more weeks that we have available, you might borrow one from some family member because somebody has some laptop they're not using or some some sort of a pc machine that they're not using and you don't need a whole lot of horsepower you don't need the latest os it runs on windows 7 it runs on windows xp even uh, i can't i mean some so it the 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 multi sim is is remarkably versatile um up to but not including being used on Macs was my understanding so i'm sorry things are or even though you partition, I'm surprised that it didn't, well, it didn't for me. <laughs> uh, my installation went directly to my C drive and that's the last place where I want my installation to go. I wanted to have my installation, my own installation, go to um, my, my uh, SD card mm -hmm. in my Surface because oh. my, my own C drive is, is already pushing the limits with respect right. to how many things I loaded on there. So it didn't give me a path like it didn't give mm -hmm. you a pathway, which right. is unfortunate because had it, had it given us a pathway, I'm sure you would have selected mm -hmm. one of the partitions you right. set up on your, mm -hmm. on your it, piece. It gave, me like, it gave me three pathways, one of itself, and then one, uh, the other two is Mac OS and then the Window OS that I partitioned in my, in my uh, boot camp here in, in yes. my Mac. And all three of them had the, the warning sign. So sorry, my friend. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you have to figure it out. All right. Okay. Uh, let's take a look. So, um, before we before we finish this conversation today, uh, the the virtual store for the college it has some cheap use uh, hardware. I would say. Maybe you might be able to find a uh, used laptop somebody doesn't need, and you can get it from there. Mm -hmm. okay. Price is really accessible. Okay. Okay, thank you for thank that you. helpful piece thank of advice. All right, so let me start from the top. Um, so Trini, so you're, you're, have you finished your download? Have you done your uh, download and installation? Hold on. Yes, I have. And, and is it installed and is it running? Uh, let me see, let me pull it up. It, I just got to where it says uh, on the side, it says application software add-ons, and then it has like four squares. So it says lab windows, measurement studio and drivers, and I don't know, that's all I got to. So I okay. figured that's the start. Yes. Yeah, continue with the process. All right, uh, as I'm going through, so downloaded. Izar, do you have it installed? Is it running yet? Uh, yes. Okay. All right. Running. Good. And then Victor. So yes, yours is running. All right. 
right. And Brandon, you're working on it. Mm -hmm. And Gerardo, is yours up and running? Yes. Running. Okay. Edwin, is yours up and running? Yes, I had downloaded it, but now it's telling me a license. Um, it's my license is about to expire or something. <laughs> so that's where I'm for, at right now. For multi-sim? It's the National Instruments uh, software, yes. right? Yeah. Yes. That's yes. the one. Yes. So did you see the same screens that I put on uh, a couple minutes ago? I didn't see your screen, no. Uh, okay. maybe, maybe it was before um, before I logged on. No, 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 no. Right no. now, I, I just did it two minutes ago, so maybe you were distracted. No, no. Um, I don't think it came on unless I was the only one. Did anybody else see that the screen? I guess he did. Okay, I didn't see it. Okay, so you should be looking at my PowerPoint now. Yes. Edwin? Edwin, talk to me. Yeah, um, I'm here. Um, I saw your okay. PowerPoint. We went through the PowerPoint. I saw that. Uh, I just didn't. Um, once I opened uh, the uh, National Instrument software, um, it gives me a warning for the licensing. It, it, it I had exactly the same thing where, again, uh, try to download uh, multisim and I had to pay for it. It's thirty five dollars. So I had to go through. Okay, then I'll do. I'll just do that. I wouldn't mind paying thirty five dollars. Yeah, that's. Uh, I went through the same the same headache. It it won't let me activate the free one, but it wants me to pay the thirty five dollars. That's what I did with the thirty five dollars. That's what I ended up doing, but I did that years ago. <laughs> but I would have thought that the solution, if they tell us it's a free six month version, that there must have been. Um, that's why back at the beginning, there was a key, there was a serial number, there was this serial number, and it would be different from, I don't know if any of you happen to have written down a serial number, but my serial number was M84X42507. So that was my uh, serial number, and that's right here. And I had up here, it says, just in case we need it for later, they would figure, hey, why would they give me a serial number if I didn't need it for later? I don't know. So I copied the serial number and I clicked download the software and I did that right before. And it was still finishing its download. I haven't finished the download. Uh, okay, so then I just, um, I'll just buy uh, the $35 one and, and then um, I, you, sh you should get an update later tonight. Okay, well, I'll tell you, I spent, I spent $45 on it two years ago, and it's the best $45 I've ever spent. So, but uh, it's unusual that, that we would have to do this if they give us a six, six month thing. But anyway, let's not argue it. It's something that, that you will never invest in your, uh, in your career, because I've used multi-SIM for years before I bought this version two years ago. Two years ago, I bought this one at 45. Before that, for 10 years, I used another version of multi-SIM before it became multi-SIM. Uh, and I bought that one as well. So it, it's something that, that I have, it's the best investment that, that I've ever made in terms of being able to uh, analyze what's going on with any of my, uh, my circuits. So with that being said, uh, what we'll do is we should probably have a follow-up meeting to talk further about multi-SIM. Um, what I'll do is I'll put together a, a, an instructional video. Speaking of which, have you been able to go to you, my YouTube channel? How many of you have checked out the Kogai videos? So Trini, have you seen the Kogai videos? If you don't know what I'm talking about, then it's a no. No, I have not. Honestly, sorry. Okay, you got to get. I'll get on it. Yeah, you got to be reading my messages to you all. All right, um, Izar, have you seen the Kogai videos? Yes. And um, Victor, have you had a chance to look at the Kogai videos? I see one, 
43 minutes long. Okay, all right. There should be, I have like five or six of them up so far. And not all of them pertain to our class, but the topics, the topics are very specific that we will be uh, touching on. Brandon, have you looked at the Kogai videos? No. Nope. Okay, that's all right. Yeah, you, you will. <laughs> Edwin, have you looked at the Kogai videos? Kogai. I have not. I've right. not seen you. G-U-I, right? Yeah, G-U-I, Kogai. Right. And Gerardo, have you looked at the Kogai videos? Maybe. No. No? Okay. And uh, let's see, that's all I have so far. So one, two, three, four, five, six. You say you sent an a, a email regarding your videos? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I pointed to, yeah, there should have been a, uh, a I made mention of the, of the Tina, the, the Tina video should, the Tina training video should be there. So since it's a mystery for some of you, Let's go ahead very quickly. And let's go to here. And let's go to here. And K K O dash G U Y Kogai. Oh, yeah. All right. G so there happens to be. Yeah, KO. Okay, so there happens to be series parallel analysis, parallel series analysis. There's a Zoom class for active HDL. Uh, yeah, that doesn't apply to you guys, but there are there are a bunch of numbering systems, par another parallel circuit, and there's also a I put a, a Tina training one. So what it is that you'll find is if you go to look up Frank Co and then hit this and then go to videos. And you play guitar, huh? I play guitar, I play ukulele. Uh, I have a violin, but I should play it better. I like stringed instruments. Anyway, so a bunch of Kogai videos here, and here's one. There's a, T, a Tina TI tutorial. So I'll put it in this area uh, where you're going to be able to run and see how different things are, are built. And so what we're going to do is I'll do uh, some tutorials on, on the... Um, On the multi-sim, because there's some AC stuff that we hadn't had a chance to expand upon that we're going to need to for um, for completing our our lessons. Okay, so there will be more stuff there for you all to look at. Okay, cool. Any follow-up questions on what the circuit build is for this week? Let's take this three dash twenty dash. Oops. And Stop the video. Uh, I don't need to hear myself. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And go ahead. Stop the share. And let me look on here. Go to Somebody's knocking on the door. Sorry, that's that's a. Uh, it's all right. Okay. That's all right. Quite all right. Okay, so this is good. I see the Tina Ti screens, the sound, uh, circuit number fifteen, circuit number sixteen. So let's take a look at this. Izar circuit number 16 analysis. That's interesting. So I'm looking at Izar's uh, and 
I see a negative value. Okay, everybody see the share screen? So this is very good. We happen to have now, aha. Uh -huh. So Izar, as I'm looking at your particular analysis here, how come I don't have a measurement for our total? Uh, sorry, I missed that. Okay, well, we're on the share screen and I believe everybody's looking at your paper. <laughs> so my question to you is how come there is no R total? So Izar, Edwin, Trini, uh, Gerardo, you guys have to have your cameras on, guys. Uh, yeah. I don't have a webcam, sorry. So Brandon, you, had a, you raised your hand, you had a question? Brandon, your, your microphone is muted, so we can't hear you asking your question. All right, sorry, sorry. Um, yeah. My R total in the analysis, uh, I didn't have that either. Well, this was Izar's. Uh, this one's not, this not Brandon's. This one happens. I'm, okay, I'm so, so yours as well. So you had a comment regarding R total? Uh, I, didn't, I didn't put a comment there. I just, uh, I didn't have an R total in the analysis. Maybe I didn't look at it hard enough, or um, I just, I didn't see it. Okay. Are we looking at the same piece of paper on my screen that, that you all have downloaded? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, there's a blank here for R total, and mm -hmm. there's a blank here for I total. Yeah. And so there's a couple of issues that I have concerns about this, and that is there's no measurement for R total. So the question goes to the author of this particular document, and Izar, not to put you on the spot, but to ask a simple question, how come you didn't measure the R total? Uh, and fill it in. I love your analysis. Look at his analysis. This is great work. Everybody see Izar's redraws? This is really nice work. So he took the original diagram, fashioned very similarly to the, to, to the uh, um, sample that I gave you all. He then did a basic redraw where R1 and R2 were combined into what we call an REQ number one. It shows R1 parallel with R2, and he came out with a certain amount of ohms that this calculated to be. And REQ1 he wrote down here was 2.11k ohms. Then when he added these three resistors in series, came out with an R total of 2.62k ohms. Beautiful work. Uh, but that 2.62k ohms, interestingly, was filled in here, but wasn't filled in here as an actual digital multimeter, multimeter measurement. So was that just, a, just an oversight, Izar? Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Now, the other thing also, guys, you want to watch out for this. This lower portion with the blue says measurements. So you all have digital multimeters. You don't take the 3.6k ohms from up above and just transfer it down here. So all of these ohm values, the 3.6k, 5.1, 183.30 are all just copied and pasted here. These have to be actual measurements off your multimeter. Okay. Wait, oh. it, did you hand out multimeter or did we use the four we supposed to buy them ourselves? Did you not receive multimeters when you were in 50? Uh, yeah, but I returned them. I returned yeah, them we gave them back. Yeah, we gave yeah. them back. So I thought the analysis measurement were supposed to be on the Tina TI. Well, yeah, um, <laughs> okay, yeah, in lieu, in, lieu of, in lieu of having actual multimeters, did all of you return your multimeters? Yes. Yes, I did. I did. Okay. All right. Okay. That being said, then I can't fault you on that, but it still is two cells that need to be filled in. <laughs> so Tina TI would have been able to give you the 2.62K. That should have been copied over here. And whatever Tina TI gives us for the current over here should be copied over here as well. So that way this exercise will be complete. 
so I'm not going to be picky about that aspect this go around. Uh, Izar more than made up for it by the quality of how his notes worked out in here that he took a picture of and sent back to us. This is really, really excellent work, Izar. I commend you. So because it is so nice and neat and so well drawn, um, you get bonus points for that. So out of 75, you're going to get 80 on that. Are you, are you upset with me in any way, shape, or form? <laughs> no, no worries. <laughs> okay. No, it's really... No, I, 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 give them to me instead. The yeah. extras. I'll take them. So here's the Tina TI where, you know, we expect to have all the information as we do. So this is very, very good. And uh, point... Yeah. No, everything looks fine. And point one shows the negative side. So that's why that came out negative for VP1, because that side rel relative to ground would be negative. Okay, that's perfectly fine. All right, cool. So as you turn in your work and as you do your work on paper, what it is you're going to find when we ultimately are able to get together is uh, the testing that you're going to be doing will not be aided by your TINA TIs, will not be aided by multi-SIM. You're going to have to be able to do this quality of analysis and understand how to do this with confidence. Is everybody clear on that? Yeah, so the more we practice this, the better each of you will get. And so we will continue with series parallel, but I will also bring in the AC component because we have to get into capacitors and uh, uh, inductors and how they behave with respect to AC. So there's some, some, some more very interesting stuff for us to learn uh, for this part of 50, for the theory side of 51, okay, in addition to the, to the, the fun hands-on soldering side. So there's these two sides of our 51 course. Okay, I think uh, I'm not gonna grade all the rest of them that you've turned in, but I'm, I'm happy to have had one that, that served as, a, as an excellent example. I'm sure the rest of our team's work is, is comparable to this, or uh, if it isn't, if it exceeds this, I will see it. Uh, and if it is uh, comparable to this, that's great. And if it's not quite this, then you really, really, really wanna follow the videos that I had and so, yeah, this is a series parallel. So, yeah, this is a good point where I come back up to the channel and go back to here. And that is series parallel. That would be this guy right here. So this was a 42-minute video, and this 42-minute video takes you through the analysis from here. Suggestion to here, you know, where we're starting our redraw. Definition for parallel. And we the reduce. Lead. We reduce these two resistors into an equivalent resistance. Then, as we go a little further, this shows the calculations, and then, then, then these that equivalent resistance of this many ohms is added with our three and our four to give us an R total. And then eventually we will calculate an R total, fill in R total. Then eventually we will use our calculator and calculate the next steps, calculate the current. So we start determining currents. And then after we build and determine our currents, slowly back up little by little, we fill in our VIR chart. We find that there's several different ways of calculating this current. Again, the video takes you through this. And then to go a little further, and then go a little further here. And once you have all the currents determined, then you can calculate the voltages using Ohm's law. So the, the reason why there's two different values written for current in for IR1 and IR2 and I total is because I was discussing in this particular uh, training video why using memory is going to provide a more accurate calculated result. Uh, and if you don't use memory, you'll have something that's close, which is fine. I accept something that's close and I make note of that in the video. So yeah, definitely get on my YouTube channel 
and to go through the videos that are appropriate. And then we wrap it, we very quickly at the end of this training video got onto Tina. And in Tina, we built this to all the ohms that were specific to what we had and all the measurements came out to match the calculations that we did in the video. So we only use the Tina, we only use the, um, the multi-SIM to double check what it is that we've done on paper. Okay. So, yes. Uh, how would you check for uh, total resistance on there? Total resistance. Yeah, for total resistance, I would have to disconnect the voltage source because you remember, you can't measure total resistance when there's current flowing through the circuit. Ohmmeters don't work that way. Okay, uh -huh. so we would disconnect the voltage source and then put an ohm meter on here and be able to measure the ohms exactly where this battery will. I would disconnect the battery, remove it completely, but I would still have the upper wire. I would hook up to one side of the ohm meter. This lower wire, I'd hook up to the other side of the ohm meter. So basically, I'm putting an ohm meter in place of this source right here, uh -huh. and that ohm meter will be able to read total ohms. Okay. okay. Oh, which one? Which one is the ohm meter again? Is it one of those? Uh, yeah, it's under meters. Other? Yeah, it's under meter, and you'll be able to select under okay. meter. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, ohm meter, sure. And then we'll we'll do the same with multi sim and uh, moving forward as as we're able to have multi sim uh, it, it, as it is more robust than Tina, we'll be making the conversion uh, of having more of our exercises on uh, multi sim. Okay. I'm glad we had a chance to review some of your uh, work in Canvas, and that hopefully is illuminating to everybody else uh, certain things that, that we're doing well. If your notes match ISARs uh, and, and method of analysis, and, and if it isn't quite the same or isn't quite uh, as, as um, well done, then it gives you something to shoot for. Okay, okay. Follow-up questions, anything remaining? Oh. Okay, keep an eye out for Canvas um, assignments, all right? I had a question. Yes, uh, please. My assignments. Yes, um, please. If I resubmit them the correct way, I guess with the video with the, the lab and naming my boards on Tina, can I still get full credit for it? it, it, it rephrase that again? Yeah, so, yes. uh, yeah, there's two assignments, the lab that we did, how I guess my video wasn't uh, working. So I only got like half. If I submit it again with the video working, I can still get full credit? Of course. Okay. And then same thing with the Tina? Yeah. Just let me know okay. because whatever yeah. I've graded, I generally don't go back and regrade looking changes. Mm -hmm. have to let me know where those are. And then I will go back and, and yeah. gladly make those changes for you. Okay? Yeah, it makes yeah, sense. Yeah. You know, you know, different, different things. You know, different things happen during the course of the week and, you know, we encounter different challenges and, you know, ever, who remembers what my middle name is? Somebody's got to, who remembers my middle name? It was something easy. Some, it was something easy. Uh, a generous, generous. No? Something like that. Uh, <laughs> flexible. Huh? Oh, who, who remembered? Mr. Flexible. I heard it. Flexible. 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 Yeah. flexible. Okay, my middle name is flexible. So, so I will remain flexible, but uh, you know, keep in mind what, what was due this past week. If it isn't complete, you complete it. You let me know what it is. I go ahead and make the adjustment, but don't wait until the end of the semester and say, hey, oh, I completed 10 and 15 of these. Now I want to grade. Well, that flexibility doesn't quite flex that much, okay? But from week to week, we can certainly be flexible because we know different things come up, all right? Is that, is that, uh, did that answer your question, Ivan? Yeah, yeah, thanks. Okay, yeah. my friend, all right. Any other questions? There were good questions. Okay, this was a great session. Thank you very much for your time. I look forward to uh, chatting with you during the course of the week. Different challenges arise for different things. Uh, just hit me with uh, emails through Canvas, okay? So until then, we'll see you. Take care. See you. Adios. Take care. Bye-bye. Good job. Good talk.